Have you come across self-contradictory statements? Well, that's what we call paradox. Hello and welcome to Buy Bites for you. In this video, let's explore the top five paradoxes that might be relatable to you in your work. So let's get started. Number one, the paradox of creativity. The best ideas come when you are doing something else. Archimedes Eureka is the best example for this. History mentions that Archimedes had stepped into a bath and shouted Eureka after noticing the level of water rising in the bathtub and then suddenly getting this great insight that the volume of water displaced must be equal to the volume of the part of his body that he had submerged. So he got this genius insight when he was doing something else, that is taking a bath. Now let's take a relatable example in science. Back in the 80s, Carrie B. Mullis was studying restriction polymorphism to detect point mutations using oligonucleotides to target DNA and identify point mutations. However, this method of using oligonucleotides worked well on a plasmid DNA which was smaller in size and could be obtained in sufficient quantity as well as purity but it wouldn't work on finding a unique gene in human DNA because the oligonucleotide would not have specifically bound to that particular site. On a complex human DNA, it would bind to hundreds of such sites depending on the sequence involved and the conditions used. So he thought of a method of raising the relative concentration of the specific area of interest in the human genome. As he was driving through the mountainous regions and enjoying nature's beauty, he got an idea of using two oligonucleotides instead of one for his thought experiment of amplifying the target site. His neurons were firing ideas of using different enzymes, several reactions that could happen in a tube, and how many such reactions could be eliminated. And suddenly, he had the Eureka moment. He thought, what if he dropped the DNTPs, the DNA sample with oligonucleotides and the polymerase in a tube and incubated for some time? The polymerase would use up all the DNTPs by adding them to the hybridized nucleotides. After this reaction was complete, he could heat the mixture, causing the extended nucleotides to be separated from the target site and then cool the mixture, allowing new unextended oligonucleotides to hybridize and follow the same process. Then he thought that the extended oligonucleotides would be far greater in number than the unextended oligonucleotides and therefore these short oligos would now go and bind to the extended oligos instead of the original target site. Moreover, the extended oligos would now hybridize to the unextended oligonucleotides of the opposite polarity in the second round. This way he could continue another such cycle by adding more DNTPs and the polymerase. This thought process gave him two great insights. Number one was that the amplified sequence signal strength would now double. And number two, he could add his own step of DNTPs and polymerase and continue the cycle as long as he wanted. Then suddenly he pressed the brakes of the car and stopped to write down the calculations that his mind was doing so fast. He took a piece of paper and wrote down the following. 2 to the power 10 was about a thousand. 2 to the power 20 was about a million. And 2 to the power 30 was about a billion. And this was close to the number of base pairs in the human genome. Bingo! Once this reaction was carried out 30 times, he thought he would be able to get the sequence of interest with a very high signal and no background at all. And then the rest is history. Today, there is no lab without a PCR machine. The point here is the sequence of thoughts that happened when he was not working rather driving the car and enjoying nature's beauty all the way long. The driving aspect is done by the subconscious mind which does routine activities on an autopilot mode without thinking being involved. Whereas 
the creative thinking comes from the neocortex and it is a conscious activity these two activities can go together without any clash in the brain so while he was driving his conscious mind was getting into a creative mode probably because of the scenic beauty around him that could have triggered his alpha brain waves which eventually brought the eureka moment in him so this is the paradox of creativity when you incubate your ideas and do something else you may get your eureka moments the next paradox is the paradox of abundance the more resources we have the less productive or creative we are there is a theory in geography that the more resources a country has the less economic growth the country generally shows it is also called the resource curse a typical example of this is venezuela although venezuela is rich in natural resources like the oil the country has poor economic growth whereas resource poor countries like singapore are economically and technologically very strong so it depends on how a country harnesses its resources and builds strategies to improve its economy the same concept could be applicable to our research as well labs that have sufficient resources may not necessarily do well whereas labs which are struggling for resources may perform better and all this has to do with the mindset of researchers you see necessity is the mother of invention when you are in a state of abundance chances are there that you tend to become complacent and relaxed and may not give your best output so you need some kind of a pressure to give out your best let's narrow this concept down to bacteria many of the lab experiments for cloning and selection use oxotrophic strains of bacteria oxotrophs are organisms that have lost the ability to synthesize certain substances required for their growth owing to the presence of mutations in industrial biotechnology researchers select oxotrophs that perform better and give high yields of the product so they subject them to high concentrations of a drug or a metabolite or even an inhibitor and see which strain performs better in those conditions and select the high performers there are many such selection experiments where you select oxotrophic mutants that work well in such extreme conditions just like a bacteria requires that special trait which allows it to grow in selective pressure and gives an ideal mutant which gives very high yield of the product you too require a selective pressure to expand your research to give out your best potential so if you have some resources lacking in your lab try to make that as your strength and figure out ways to give the best output in spite of that lack so this is the paradox of abundance so manage your resources well and try to come up with ideas that can be done in minimal steps the next paradox is the paradox of originality the more we copy or imitate the work of others the better we are at innovations let's take the work of nobel laureate joshua lederberg lederberg was interested in replicating avery's transformation experiments in neurospora but he failed let's check out avery's transformation experiment Avery concluded from his experiments that DNA was the genetic material present in those microbes that led to the transformation of the bacterial colonies from smooth type to rough type. Soon, Beadle and Tatum had created many mutant strains of Neurospora that had helped them propose the one gene one polypeptide hypothesis. Now, Lederberg wanted to combine these two ideas. Number one was to use bacteria. Number 2 was to make mutants of bacteria just like neurospora to check what happens in bacteria is there any recombination mechanism happening in bacteria just like neurospora that was his thought at that time period not much was known about bacterial genetics so lederberg met edward tatum who had already created some oxotrophic mutants of e coli kidra so lederberg set two rules for his experiments 
Rule number one was mix bacteria with nutritional requirements, which are the oxoprops, and select recombinants with no special nutritional requirement, that is the prototrophs. Prototrophs can grow in minimal media. Now, rule number two is he wanted to make oxoprops that were double or triple mutants so that there is very little chance of these mutants reverting back to wild type. A single mutant has a chance to revert to wild type, whereas a double or triple mutant has negligible chance of reverting back to wild type. So he used strain 1, which was oxotropic for two genes A and B, and crossed it with another oxotropic strain having defective genes C and D. When he crossed the two strains, the strain that was obtained was a prototroph. As hypothesized, he obtained recombinants. So based on this observation, Lederberg back in the 50s initially proposed that bacteria also undergo some kind of fertilization like other higher organisms to give a transient diploid by some kind of a cell fusion and eventually undergo recombination. So excited by this information, another scientist from Cornell, Bernard Davis, wanted to explore the sexual mechanism and he wanted to address the question whether cell-to-cell -cell contact was required or was it some kind of a soluble factor. So he designed a YouTube which was partitioned by an ultra-fine filter which would not allow organisms to pass through but the soluble factors could pass through it. So the two bacterial strains that yielded recombinants in Lederberg's experiment were grown in the YouTube separated by a filter. After sufficient incubation, the cells were plated to check for recombinant clones and as expected, there were no clones. So the soluble factor was ruled out and he concluded that cell to cell contact was required. So it was some kind of a sexual conjugation for which the mechanism was not yet known. Anyway, the point here is that just by replicating one set of experiments in another model organism eventually led to the discovery of plasmids and today we are doing extensive cloning with those plasmids. So this is the paradox of originality where you initially try to replicate the same idea in another model system and check if it gives the same result. When it does, there's nothing to worry. You are reinforcing the concept that it is true. But when you do not get those results and get something different, then you know for sure that you are entering a new zone, maybe a very interesting discovery down the line. Now let's move on to the next paradox and it is the paradox of need. The more you need help, the harder it is to get. Let's talk about Barry Marshall's discovery. Back in the 80s, no one accepted that peptic ulcer was caused by a bacterial infection. Most experts believe that Helicobacter was a harmless organism that was infecting people who had ulcers for some other reason. But Barry had strong evidence that the bacteria H. pylori was causing ulcers. Unfortunately, the scientific community did not accept his findings. He struggled to infect an animal model that could prove his point. And moreover, very few supported his work. But most of his work was rejected for publication and he was met with constant criticism that his conclusions were premature and not well supported. When he presented his work, his results were disputed because they simply could not be true. People believed that bacteria were either contaminants or harmless common cells. Secondly, no one was able to replicate his results. But his medical experience showed that patients with life-threatening ulcers were easily treated with a two-week course of antibiotics and did not even require a surgery. So he developed the hypothesis that bacteria cause ulcers that eventually led to stomach cancer. And if the hypothesis worked, he could revolutionize the treatment modality for such ulcers with simple and cheap drugs without the need for complex surgery. For the sake of patients who were suffering from ulcers, he knew his research had to be fast-tracked. 
His sense of urgency had driven him to get the theory proven quickly in order to provide curative treatment for the millions of people suffering from ulcers around the world. So, he drank a culture of Helicobacter to prove his point that bacteria could infect a healthy person and cause gastritis. And eventually, his hypothesis was accepted in 1994 and later he was awarded a Nobel Prize for his discovery. And here's where it's important. When you put others first and risk your life with a vision of helping millions of people, then the universe definitely has your back. Great discoveries and inventions happen like this. Eventually, Universe awarded him the Nobel Prize for his brilliant discovery. So this is the paradox of me. Trust yourself and do the experiments with the vision of contributing to the scientific community, no matter how people disregard your findings. And eventually, the success will be on your side. Now let's move on to the final paradox. And it is the paradox of skill. The more you and your competitors are evenly matched in your skills, luck plays a major role. In the early 70s, Paul Berg's lab conceived the idea of using a series of enzymes to covalently join DNAs together in vitro. But their construction of recombinants consisted of many tedious steps, which included initially an endonuclease treatment followed by exonuclease, then a terminal transferase and then a ligase. This way, SV40 and the phage lambda gene recombinant molecule was produced that was introduced in mammalian cells. Soon, another person called Janet Mertz joined Paul Berg's lab and observed under an electron microscope that echoharmon cut plasmid molecules could re anneal back and form circular DNA. This meant that the cut DNA contained sticky ends that could join back together to form circular DNA. So Janet had this idea that the long, tedious step of covalently joining two DNA could be reduced to two steps instead of the six tedious steps. And that methodology worked. This inspired her to come up with a proposal. Why not reverse the SV40 experiment? Instead of SV40 combining with phage DNA and being introduced into the mammalian cells, let's fuse SV40 gene in lambda phage and infect bacteria. Unfortunately, many researchers believe that E. coli carrying the SV40 DNA could potentially spread a cancer-causing gene within the human population. So, these researchers had to stop their work in this direction. Around the same time, two other scientists, Herbert Boyer, who had an expertise with restriction endonucleases, and Stanley Cohen, who had studied plasmids that could be easily transmitted to other bacterial species, met at a conference in 1972 and the two decided to combine their research efforts. The Cohen-Boyer team was able to cut open a plasmid from one species of bacteria and inserted a gene from different bacterial species and ligated the plasmid. This created a recombinant DNA molecule, a plasmid containing DNA from two different sources. Next, they inserted the plasmid into bacteria and demonstrated that the recombinant DNA could be used by bacteria. The team had created the first genetically modified organism or molecular chimera. Their chimeras were entirely based on bacterial genes and were considered far less hazardous than the idea of introducing SV40 in bacterial genes. So their work got a green signal. Later, they used this technique to insert the gene from frog into bacteria proving that it was possible to transfer genes between two very different organisms. Eventually, Herbert Boyer and his friend co-founded Genentech, the first biotechnology company. Now, let me tell you a few things here. Everyone has unfair advantages that make them lucky. Luck can be boosted in the following ways. Number one, by meeting more people in your research field. Number two, by attending more conferences and getting to know the different kinds of research work. Number three, publishing your work in journals. And number four, getting feedback. Actually, Herbert Boyer 
had successfully purified eco-argon enzyme and had initially supplied it to Paul Berg's lab. And that is where Janet Mertz found out the interesting property of this enzyme. So he got feedback about eco-argon enzyme. Number five, take action on your idea. Both Cohen and Boyer quickly took action on their new idea. All these factors prepared Herbert Boyer for a breakthrough that led to the birth of the first recombinant DNA technology company that could bulk produce medically important biologicals that help millions of people across the globe. So this is the paradox of skill. The more you and your competitors are evenly matched in your skills, luck plays a major role. And now over to you. So which paradox do you relate with the most? Please comment below and let me know.